Chris Catch Hayes, don't ever fucking do it again. The Bro 4 Squad is taking the field to give you a bro back on Major League. I'm Matt Geiger, alongside our cleanup hitter in his lab, Brian Banner, grading everything on our five criteria, starting with Cass. So Banner, throwing the ball to you. Major League is like, has all the has-beens before they were has-beens back before they made their comebacks. Does that make sense? It, it makes almost too much sense that I want you to explain it, but it would be stupid too. Yeah, like you got Charlie Sheen, Wesley Snipes, like those guys, this was back before they were has-beens and then didn't get their, well, Wesley Snipes really did, never got his break back, but no. like this is when they were in their prime and you put them all in a sports movie, like doing what they do, like none of them had to overdo what they did. Like they just said, hey, Here's a glove, here's a ball, go be you. So, in an Indian's outfit. This came out in 89. So Sheen is just right on... I think Sheen's first movie was Ferris Bueller's Day Off at the very end, I believe. Sheen is coming right in, red hot. I believe he uh, does Young Guns kind of after this. Once again, as you mentioned, Wesley Snipes does White Man Can't Jump after this. Corbin Burnson... Fantastic actor. I like everything he's in. Watch Hatfields and McCoys. He's great Fantastic. in that. Tom Berenger. I like pretty much everything he's in, too. Bob Euchre, I think, steals a show in this as just the guy that lives and dies by the team who's the public address announcer that does the radio commentary and gets drunk as they play. Renee Russo in her prime hot Renee Russo as Jake Taylor's love interest in this is great. And James Gammon who is uh, the the manager, Lou, is fucking fantastic in this too. So going right into story, just basically to catch you guys up if you haven't seen this in a while, it almost feels like a documentary, like I said, set in 1989 when the Indians sucked and their owner, Rachel Phelps, wants to take them to Miami, which is believable because the Florida Marlins gets a team probably like five or six years after this. I think they moved there in like 94 or something, Yeah, right? it was probably 93, 94. So this is a very believable story. And, I mean, LeBron left Cleveland, so why wouldn't the, the Indians in 89? It makes a ton of sense. So they basically just get shitty players no one else wants and basically just kind of forfeits the season a la NBA to try to get the first pick in the draft so they can move to Miami. Do you have – what else can you add to that? Like, especially here recently, when we're, film, when we're recording this in, in 2017, like there's a big thing in the NBA about uh, like losing for the number one pick. And like that's basically what this movie is, except instead of the number one pick, they're losing to move the entire franchise. And I just think it's really funny how it, it doesn't matter what sports it is. It's the same through line all the time. We suck, and then all of a sudden we're going to win. This is this comes out, like, what, four or five years before Angels in the Outfield? Exact same premise. Yeah. Hey, we fucking suck. Everybody's going to get fired unless something magical happens. I remember watching this as a kid and thinking, the Indians don't suck because this was, when I was a kid, they had Albert Bell, Kenny Lofton, Carlos Baerga, Earl Hershiser. Andrew jo Jones? Yeah, and they... Uh, they went to the, I believe, the World Series against the Braves and lost that year. Yeah, I loved Albert Bell. To the, to the AL yeah, championship. they were always right there. So I kind of thought this was fiction, and my dad had to tell me, no, the Indian has sucked for a really, really long time. A great, There's a lot of great one-liners, but as you touched on, them basically just forfeiting the season. Whenever she was around the management group and she gives them a list of players, and the guy's like, this guy here is dead. And she's like, cross him off then. That's one of the greatest like one-liners. I always laugh at that. You got to watch this movie on DVD though. On TV ruins it because it's the only major league movie that's actually rated R. So going right into best scene, what do you got for best scene in this movie? My favorite scene. It's maybe not the best scene, but I just really like it. it's when they move Wesley Snipes' uh, cot or his bed out into the parking lot, yeah. and he's like, "Oh hell no!" Nah. And then he ends up in that forty-yard dash barefoot running down the foul line and they're just like get this man a jersey because all he can do is run and then later on in the movie uh he goes into the batter's box and he's like flipping the batter and he can't even hold it like it's it just i don't know I, something about it always resonated with me i just thought it was so funny it doesn't matter if you're actually good at your sport but if you're good at one thing they're gonna sign you up 
there's no uh, dial dialogue to this, but whenever he keeps popping up on the top of the batting cage screen, I laugh out loud every fucking time. <laughs> and the manager's like, what the hell? With your speed, you should be hitting on the ground legging it out. And he makes him do all the push-ups. My best scene is uh, the first full game they play against the Yankees, who, of course, the Yankees are always good, and they're like the top team. And their big hitter comes to the plate and asks Taylor what the fuck he's doing back in the major league. He's like, how's your wife and my kids? I used to use that all the time playing baseball. I thought that was hilarious. And that's when Rick Vaughn gets thrown out for giving up a grand slam. And they leave him in to see how he reacts. And he hits the batter and then tells the ump to blow him and walks out. I, I love that whole scene. It's uh, It takes me back to my baseball playing days. It's fucking awesome. I don't know. There's there's maybe other than Bull Durham, that's probably the best baseball scene that we actually get in any baseball movie. So impacts on pop culture, you know, I don't know, man. They made three of them. I, I like them all. I like this one probably the best because it's rated R. I'll tell you, I'll drink, I'll, the I'll drink a six-pack and watch Back to the Miners. That's another thing we agree with. I'll watch Back to the Miners. I love Major League 2, too. I, I hate that they got rid of Wesley Snipes. I mean, Omar Epps does a pretty good job, but I mean, impacts on pop culture. What do you got on this? I mean, they made three of them. They're pretty three good movies. Yeah, I think that this is kind of the dawn of if you make one good movie, they're gonna give you a second and a third one, and like automatically in Hollywood. But I think this is kind of the shift um, from the one-two punch that we had in like the '70s and '80s, and even the solo films, to where you're starting to see franchises. And it, it's kind of like, how are you gonna make a more movies off of one where like it ends like. Hey, they're staying in Cleveland. Like, yeah. that's how it ends. And then they're like, oh, well, it's cool. We're going to make another one and then another one that, if you actually think about it logically, it doesn't really make sense. But yet it does. And, and we're just going to continue to throw movies. I think this is kind of the birth of, of big-time franchises with, with those, those kind of big-time names. Yeah, it, it makes sense in the second one a little bit. To, they get bounced from the playoffs. They're trying to go in the World Series in the second one. The third one... I, I never got if Gus Cantrell was actually on the Indians team or how does he know all those guys. I don't know if he was on like a like a long innings relief pitcher or something like that out of the bullpen, but I still love the movie. I think that actually has more baseball aspect to it of the hitter, you know, being a pull hitter trying to go the other way and stuff like that. That's why I like it so much. But right into rewatchability, honestly, this one didn't have as much rewatchability for me as the other two, and here's why. Because I'm lazy. And if I'm going to watch a movie, I'll just – I will honestly watch a movie illegally through the internet when I have the DVD a room away because I don't want to put it in the DVD player. And this movie can't be watched on TV. It's rated R. It's rated R for a reason because all the great jokes are rated R vulgar jokes. So I don't watch this as much as the other ones, but I will watch it you know, before spring training or something like that. What about you? Yeah, like you said, this one isn't as big of rewatchability. Honestly, I would rather watch Back to the Miners than this one over and over again. And I think a lot of that, I think you hit the nail on the head, is a lot of it is because you can't watch it on TV. And I'm too lazy to go and pop in the DVD, I, I, I'll be honest with you. But Back to the Miners is on TV quite a bit. And that one you can actually watch on TV because they don't cut out all the good jokes. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where I'm at on reach watchability. I'll, I'll watch it once every year, a couple years, but... Multiple times, and, and especially for the franchise, it's it's definitely second to uh, back to the minors. Before we go, I don't get why Dorn was so pissed that Ricky Vaughn fucked his wife. If Charlie Sheen in 89 banged my wife, I'd be like, damn, my wife's pretty hot. That should be a feather in your cap, sir. Either that or she's a drug dealer. Yeah. <laughs> but you might want to get checked. I don't know when he got the hiv, so. Yeah. We've been the Bro4 Squad. Our website is www.bro4squad.com. We have blogs. We have Hall of Fame. we got a bunch of shit up there, so why don't you go check it out. Twitter, at Bro4 Squad. We tweet funny shit, so follow us. And YouTube and iTunes is where you can find all our content. So please subscribe because we're hungry and we need to eat. Until then, we will see you later.